Good afternoon everyone and welcome to our webinar this afternoon. Today we're covering an introduction to managing road pavement assets. Um, today we have two ARB in-house experts joining me in the studio to deliver this webinar, so I'd like to welcome John Roberts and Simon Barlow. But before we start the presentation, ladies and gentlemen, as usual we'll cover off a few formalities with some housekeeping slides. Today's webinar will be approximately 45 to 50 minutes in duration and as per usual we welcome your questions and comments along the way. Please don't leave your questions until the end ladies and gentlemen, uh, we like to keep the discussion going during the presentation. As usual we record the presentation today so don't worry too much about taking notes as the recorded material and presentation material will be sent to everyone once the webinar has concluded. As I mentioned, we welcome discussion and questions and feedback along the way. So in your control panel, we have a questions box and you can type your comments in here and the presenters will receive them at our end and discuss. Without further ado, um, welcoming our presenters today, which is of course John Roberts, he will be our main presenter and Simon Barlow, who will be taking on a bit of a moderator role today. So welcome John and Simon. Thank you. Thanks very much. Hello, everybody. Thank you and hello. Um, so I'm Simon and this is John next to me. Um, as Angela said, welcome to Managing Road Pavement Assets, uh, the first free webinar in what will be an ongoing series over the next couple of months. Um, today we're going to uh, be talking about the general overview of managing road pavements and introducing some of the concepts for today. Um, as Angela said, the main presenter for today is John Roberts. John's been with ARB 19 years and has been 35 years in the uh, industry working across a range of different assets and also across a range of different continents including Europe, Africa, Asia and, and eventually settled in Australia much to our benefit. Myself, i am uh, been with ARB about 10 years now and I'm part of the data collection department. I'll be your consistent companion across the entire uh, series. You will hear my voice every week with a different expert in the chair bringing some of the best information about managing road pavements. Just to get us started, Angela said that this is an interactive activity and the first um, thing you'll see, we'll have some quizzes through coming through the sessions to get you updated, but we'll, just as a launch and a practice one, Angela, would you like to bring up the first question for the day? You can see it comes up as a blue box on your screen there. If you just would be able to answer what category below best describes your role in pavement asset management? Hopefully we'll have a range of people across uh, people attending. I know there's some people all the way across Australia. I'm including someone from Jamaica, which so is great. Welcome to our international guests to this webinar. <clears throat> Fantastic. Well, we'll just leave that open for a moment longer until our audience can get their responses through. Uh, do either of you suspect we might have a popular answer choice here? Who do you think will be... Uh, our clientele today? Well, I think um, we'll have a mix. We'll have a mix between the people just starting out and the people who have just been recently reassigned to a new role with asset management. I'd like to think we've got a few of the old, uh, the old school here as well who want a bit of a refresher, but let's see what they tell us. No worries at all. All right, I'll <coughs> close that poll off for the moment. Thank you to those of you who got your answers in. And, uh, share those results quickly with our presenters. So we do have uh, the majority of our audience have answered other, um, but we do have senior engineer or management as a second highest answer choice there. So we do thank you for getting your answers in as we can tailor our presentation to suit our audience. So thanks for your participation. Thanks very much guys and that's a good spread again. That means that we've got people coming from different divisions and different departments and different backgrounds tuning in today. So it's good to hear. Just as a background about who ARB is and why we're giving this presentation today, um, ARB's been around and what the acronym stands for is the Australian Road Research Board. We've been around since the 60s and we cover a range of both research and uh, technical specialty as well as products. And it's about bringing what is the research ideas into practical expertise and about how to deliver it, so how to manage your networks in the best approach. Um, we have offices in Melbourne, which we're currently broadcasting from, Sydney, Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth. 
just to set the scene about why we're talking about managing road assets is that Australia is in a unique position that we have a large road network, yet we have very few people in terms of what our tax base is. That means that Australia's had to be a lot smarter and a lot more clever about the way that we manage our road networks. And so the way that we can do that is by actually being um, making better savings and better decisions about the way we manage our road networks. As an example, if you divide the road network by the number of people we have in Australia versus something in America, America has five times the number of people for each kilometre of road network, which means the tax base and how they can afford to build their roads is a lot different to the, um, the experience that we have here in Australia. In Australia, across those 850,000 kilometres of road network, we have, you can see there, the split up about 40% sealed, about 40% um, gravel or unsealed roads. We have a, a section of the formed roads also. And this is interesting. For, for this source, is the last time that this survey was done across the entire Australia in 2005. But I know the, the 1995 data was a lot different. Well, yes, 1995, we had one-third of the network was sealed and one third with gravel. So what we can see here is there's been a progression where the gravel has now become nearly 40% and the sealed road, road, road network has also become nearly 40%. So we're gradually getting things better. We're definitely doing some kind of management out there and that's a, that's a good sign as we step through. The next slide's a slide I really, really like. It was originally commissioned when Obama came to power in America back in 2009, and they were asking about what does it take to upkeep the road network. And this is a really good, I hope, takeaway for anyone who's going to have a conversation with their uh, budgetary superiors, whether it be the council or, or people above you in your organisation. Effectively, what we're saying is that to maintain good road maintenance, good road management through proper maintenance, by good decisions, costs about one-seventh of what it actually costs to rebuild the road from scratch when it's totally fallen apart at the end of its life. We can do a lot better by um, doing continuous maintenance throughout the life cycle and maintaining that asset to its optimum performance and saving ourselves quite a bit of money. And talking about that, I'm sure as most of you know, in terms of the budgets of our organisations, um, for most road owners, that maintenance of that road actually makes up a fair chunk of what your budget is. It's the by far the largest assets and most expensive asset that most um, councils, for example, own, and they have to spend a large chunk of money maintaining that service. So if we actually have, if it's the biggest part of our budget, we also have the biggest chance to make those savings on the way that we manage our roads, and they can be funneled across, obviously, to different schools, hospitals, or, of course, more roads, which is good for anyone else in, in the industry out there. Yes, let's hope it's more roads. <laughs> <laughs> so across this series over the next uh, couple of months, we're going to be talking about a range of these different issues and how we can be smarter about our road asset management. We can do it um, through the data we collect, how we report, how we, we can also um, do our works programs, some advanced modelling, some increased efficiency on our networks, and also about how we implement our road safety into the way we deal with our asset management. A lot of this information that we'll be talking about uh, over these series and today is set out in the Austroids guideline, which uh, many of you will have access to. If not, you can go to the Austroids website and be able to look up that information. Um, and that covers over, you can see, the entire range of road assets, so including bridges and other sorts of works that you require. I should just add, I think it's good to add here that if you are a member of Ostroads, if you are local government or state government or federal government, you can have free access uh, through the Ostroads website to this documentation. Yep, and that will give, give you a lot more detail um, <coughs> above and beyond. Hopefully part of this... Uh, webinar is that you'll be able to get a really good broad overview of how it all fits together and then you can delve into the detail or, or get in touch with, with us to have some more detailed information about it. For those who have done any asset management, the idea of what we do with the, any kind of asset management cycle, it's not just roads, we basically look in this cycle of asset management. It is 
basic questions of what do I have, what do I want to do with it, how do I do it, and then I actually do those works, and then I go back and then I look at it again. It's a continuous cycle of looking after whether it be roads, buildings, bridges, any asset that's within our portfolio. This is a very simple uh, version of it, but the version we're going to be looking at over the next, uh, for this session, looks a lot like this. We'll be revisiting it. It looks very complex at this uh, current time, but we're going to break it down so you can understand what all those details and how they interact with each other. And I think by the end of the session, you'll be able to understand all of this pretty easily. Without too much more to do, I'm going to pass over to John Roberts, uh, who's had a lot of experience in this area, and he's going to take us through um, how we put together the road pavement asset management cycle. John. Thank, thank you very much, Simon, for that uh, very good introduction. So, what are we going to achieve from this session? Well, we've broken this down into four different areas. The first thing is we want to find out how is our network now? What, is, what do we know about our roads already? Then we want to look at how we're going to do future planning to make things better. Then we're going to look at how we actually implement those decisions and actually do some building. And then the last thing, we'll look at a few real-world applications. Now, knowing about your network to begin with is absolutely vital, of course, and um, I'd like to really take you through the procedure for doing that. And I'd like to say that the people I'm expecting to be speaking to is everything from newly qualified, experienced people, management people, or people who just want a refresher. But what I also want to say is for all of you, let's start with a blank canvas. No, no pre presuppositions about what we're going to do. What is that, Simon? <laughs> okay. We're a bit better than that. <clears throat> okay, asset management cycle. Now let's start at the beginning. The first thing you need to do is know what roads you're in charge of. You want to know what the road class is, and if you don't know the class, you might actually decide have to decide what, what the classes are. You will make that decision, and you'll need to know where all those roads are physically. Here we have a generic road network just a diagram, but it's very useful because it shows you the freeways in blue, uh, there's even some gravel roads there, those yellow gravel roads, and then of course most of the other roads are red. We just need to divide our network up according to links and nodes, and nodes are often chosen to be at intersections where there's a change in traffic flow. Here's a simple example we've done before. On the left hand side we have the network which is set out in blue, and you'll see that it's been divided up into nodes and links with the, those, those green markers. But i also like to point out is you'll see that there's many other roads on this map, but the reason we picked out the blue ones is that these blue roads happen to be the responsibility of the person who, who, who would be looking after these roads. He's not interested in all the other roads. He's only interested, he or she is only interested in the blue roads. Once we've decided what roads we've got in our network, from a theoretical point of view, from a map, from old records, we then need to make sure we label all of these sections of road. The label can be quite long, it doesn't really matter, computers can handle that sort of thing, but it needs to be very descriptive. So the labels you see here are very descriptive. Every single digit or numeral there has a meaning and it has a significance. Once we've established that network from a theoretical point of view, we need to go out there and look at the nodes and links and make sure we can measure them in, in the flesh, so to speak. So on the left here we have Richard Wicks, who I should add is um, slightly um, wider fellow than he is shown there. And he's, this is him setting up, setting up a node using a local GPS coordinates, a node which happens to be uh, an island at a certain intersection. And then we have on our right hand side we have one of our network survey vehicles where we would send that vehicle around and it would measure every 10 meters, for example, the center line chainage and the center line GPS coordinates for the links. So everything is defined on the ground as well. Now here we've got our network. Now what do we do next? Well, I know what I've got in terms of where the network is, but what's actually there? How, what, what type of roads have I got? What's the drainage? What type of drainage? What type of pavements? What type of subgrade? Subgrade is very important. It, it drives a lot of what goes on with pavements. And then another thing which is very important, and I regard this very much as part of the inventory, is climate records. What is the climate like? What is the traffic currently flowing on your road? And what sort of maintenance are you currently undertaking on that road? 
Those are perfectly legitimate questions to ask about understanding your inventory and what have you got. And here we have a urban network which happens to be local government in Melbourne area. The different colours here are in fact a record, not of the pavement type, but of the type of maintenance currently being undertaken on those pieces of road. This is not a works program, this is a record of the maintenance currently being taken part on those roads. And that's an important part of understanding why the roads are the way they are. So talking of getting to know why the roads are the way they are, we've now discovered what the network is. We know what roads we've got, the types of pavements and where they, what they look like. Now we've got to think about what condition are they in. Now condition I like to break down into two areas. First of all is things like physical condition, like the surface, the potholing, the roughness, structural condition. Those are physical things, but also things like how wide is your road and what sort of travel speeds can you go on that road and what are the road safety issues on your road and what's the environmental impact you have on the road and the road has on your and the road has on you have on the on the environment and the environment has on your road those are all part of the condition and the service delivered we've got all this information now we need to really turn it into something useful so to turn data into information we need to process it and the processing at this stage is just transforming the data through aggregating it into groups, summarizing it, maybe ranking it and categorizing it. There's all sorts of ways you can do that. And by doing that, you can then understand a very large amount of data and break it down into groups of information, which makes our life much easier. So we have all this information, and with its inventory information or condition information, and we need to put it somewhere. Now, the best place to put it is on a map, because then we can all see it and understand it. So here we are back to this road network. This is just the skeleton of the network. We've just defined where the roads are. Now we're going to attach to that some condition parameters. Now red might be a roughness condition, it could be a strength condition, it could be all sorts of things, or it might even just be a type of pavement. The important thing is we can have many layers in our maps, and each layer will show a different, net, uh, a different inventory or condition parameter which has been attached to that framework, which is that road network. Now you might say that we have all this information, but what's the use of having it unless we can tell someone about it? And this is the third, the, this is the fifth box within this stage, and that is where we have to think about reporting what we've done. You can think of it as an internal detailed report, which we, was, we we're working in the agency will use for future planning. Or we need to report to the people who provide the money and also need to report to the people who use the roads. It's only fair. So the external summary report could be a glossy brochure, which a state road authority might provide as an annual report, or a glossy brochure which might be provided by local government to the ratepayers basically describing how the roads are now and where their, their taxpayers' money is being spent. So this whole part of the cycle, which is now these five parts, we refer to as the current status, which is, is the collection of the data, the processing of it, and the writing of the reports. Now this is where we really thoroughly understand our network, how it is now. This sort of information can be enough for doing future planning without any further analysis because if you know this much information about your network you also know where the gaps are and you can already start thinking about where you need to do some work. But if you do need to do some further analysis with, with maybe prediction modeling then this is a start point. You have to have a start point and this is it and the best start point is thorough knowledge about your road as it is now. Definitely. So we've got to that first point in our in halfway around our circle there about our current status. And to, talking about current status, we're going to chuck up the second questionnaire for for our webinar today is, which is about what size is the network that you're dealing with currently. Um, we've got a couple of examples there. Are you a, a council where you may have a couple of hundred kilometres up to? We have a couple of people from the state road authority, so a couple of thousand. 
I think probably across our mix, we'll I think we'll probably get most in the in the mid category, and I, I suspect there'll probably be some people who are, are dealing with a range of different um, range of different roads and different networks across their uh, across their jobs. That could be a, a contractor or, or those kind of people. What Absolutely. Well, we've got uh, seventy percent of our people have voted, so I might just leave that open for another moment or two. Uh, while everyone else responds, but we do have quite a good cross-section there. Uh, at the moment, we do have our largest group, 37%, uh, is looking after 100 to 1,000 kilometres. So. Oh, that's good. I'd like to say hello to all the, the local government people there who I think probably responded to that one. Obviously, local government networks tendency, especially at the the smaller rural ones, some of the larger rural ones may be bigger, but um, yeah, in about that area, I think that's about right. Yes, it was interesting, uh, you saw how um, Simon predicted that that would be the sort of numbers we've got, which really means we don't need to do these webinars anymore to tell you anything. We can just get on and just do all the work and you just trust us to do it correctly. <laughs> Only worked quite like that. Oh, you'll put me out of a job, John, if that's the case. <laughs> All right, so we've got to that point. Thank you very much for your responses. Um, we'll keep going. John, what's next after you've got to your current status? Well, once we've, we've got the current status, we've got to start thinking of the future. And the future is driven by three main things. And I, I, I just want to clarify, the, these, this is jargon which is thrown around, but it, jargon actually which has a very very good meaning, and I, I'll just start with the first thing, are policies. The policy is something to look, driven by politicians, and that is, what is the overall policy? Do we want our roads to gradually get better, or do we want to know how we, what we need to do to the network to maintain as it is in its current condition, or do we want to look after some special things like increased axle limits? In fact, I'll be talking about increased axle limits towards the end of this seminar. But what do we want to handle? And that's part of the policy. But once that's been decided, then we need to say, well, if you want to go for a better road, then you're going to have to increase your standards. You're going to have to intervene more often and maybe more savagely with more expensive, um, more expensive uh, treatments so that you can achieve a higher standard. And higher standards cost more money. So if you want a very, um, a very ambitious policy, then you'll need to have high standards, and high standards mean money, but then you need to think, can you afford the money? Can you afford those budgets? They should be affordable and sustainable. We have here an example, a very nice simple example of how it would work. On the left-hand side here, the, on the y-axis, we've got the existing condition of the network. We're talking here in International Roughness Index, so that's in um, IRI. So for those of you in the old money, that's 110 NASA roughness counts. 4.2 IRI. That is the existing condition of the network. We've been told that we've only got $10 million to spend. Well, if you've only got $10 million to spend every year, then you will do your modeling and you will be able to present the results and show that with $10 million, the network is gradually going to get less and less good. As you can see, the roughness is getting higher as the years tick by. Then the, the manager or the politician might say, okay, 10 million isn't going to do it. What happens if you get 15? If you run the models again and you find 15 million can just about keep things as they are. And if the politician really wants to go 20 million, then and say wants things to get better to a target of three and a half, then you can maybe anticipate reaching that target after about 10 years. We've spoken about the strategic level, the policy and the, the, um, the standards and the budgets. Now we're going to think, once we've decided what the policy is and how much money we've got and the standards, we've got to implement that policy. And you implement it by undertaking a works program, which is not just network-wide, but is actually attached to in actual designated sections of road in need of work. Your works program must be designed to handle the backlog, and we always seem to have backlogs, and yet also model the future and look after the future. But the thing I need to emphasize is, Whatever you do must be affordable and sustainable. Here we have an example of a works program. Could be anywhere. Here we have the roads on the left, the district where they are, the, the length of the roads, the type of work envisaged, and then the cost uh, be, which has been estimated for doing the works in the different years of the works program. 
Now, when you've got a works program, and especially if it pops out of a computer, you really got to be careful because some computers can pop out some pretty dodgy works programs. You need to make sure that you go and check your works program on site. You don't have to visit every single place, but you need to visit a sample of them so you can feel comfortable that they're right. You may also need to go and visit the site and do more analysis so you can maybe handle more complicated situations. You've got to go out there and ground truth and verify that things are what they should be. So you've got a ground truth the works program. You go out there, you might need to do a site visit and see what needs to be done. Now with your site visits, you need to handle things like, here we have an example of a, an unsealed road which has got some erosion problems, drainage problems, erosion problems. Here we've got to think, well, is that our main issue or not? And it's not until you go on site and check it out, you notice that there's a lot more going on here. We have an intersection at the top of that road which is, un, is not seen as you drive along it. There's no signage there, so maybe, in fact, the road safety issue is a bigger one than that. But what I also should say is you might have seen about three slides back, we did have a little banner at the bottom there which mentioned a, a, um, a, another webinar coming up later on in a few, couple of months' time, which is all to do with planning the future, prediction modeling, and, and um, get, getting a handle on how to do works programs and site inspections. Excellent. And just this point on the slide here that um, Obviously, road safety you can see coming into conjunction with the way that we're managing our pavements, and uh, that's an important part also. Yeah. In fact, the ultimate aim is to have a safe road network. And planning for the future. Here we might have a case, well, are we going to seal the gravel road or not? Well, you can't just make that decision on a whim. You need to carry out some proper analyses to make sure you can justify the extra cost of doing that. You may also decide but the time has come to return what previously was a sealed road, which has now become unmaintainable, unaffordable and unsustainable. You've decided the only way to handle it, it's got so many potholes, is to rip it all up and return it to gravel. Now that is not a sign of defeat, it's a perfectly legitimate decision you might need to make. So here we have this next segment of our, of our, our cycle. We've, got the, we've had the first part of the current status. Now we've got the future plans. We're looking at the future and doing our budgets and trying to plan for better things. And I've colored this in blue, and it's a very important part of the whole cycle. So speaking about that, when we're looking to the future, my next question on the poll is today. Um, what is the main driver of your works program for your jurisdiction? Who makes the call there? Are you looking at it uh, a worst first? So that's a very simple uh, what condition it is. Are you looking for best value of the treatment when you're going out to tender of lowest cost? Are you doing some kind of life cycle analysis, maybe using a pavement management system piece of software? Or are you uh, more in terms of dealing with people who shout the loudest? And it's okay, it's an anonymous poll, so feel free to uh, be brutally uh, truthful about it um, and it's just the natural way that we go and I'm, I'm interested to see the results for this one John. Yes well we'll, we'll soon see. Look I, I won't let you make any predictions this time. You were right last time and we want to make sure we don't take away these people's voting rights. Absolutely. Well we'll leave that open for another moment but it is looking like uh, worst first is the most popular answer choice here with about 54% of voters have can, answered that way. Can you pop that one up on the screen please Anne so everyone else can see that? Absolutely. Excellent. So you can see up there on the screen guys uh, most people responded uh, that they're dealing with the worst first approach so that's really interesting about uh, that first part of the cycle and, and looking at your condition of your roads uh, is, a, is a very big driver for what they're doing and uh, that's good to hear. Well, it's, it's good to hear and not so good to hear. It's, uh, it, to me, it means you haven't got enough money to maintain your network and you're in panic mode. And um, it's, it's not such a great thing. And maybe that means it's all the more important that you come to the rest of our seminar series and learn how to get out of the worst first category and get on some proper future planning. It's true. As, as I said at the start, if you put a little bit more effort and time into good road management practices, we'll be able to uh, have save a bit more money on the downside and actually produce a better road network. Spend a bit of money to save a bit of money. So Absolutely. Spend goes. a dollar and save seven. 
Okay, well now we're getting into the almost the home straight here. We've um, we've we've seen what our network's like. We've looked at the future. We've made plans, and now we want to implement them. And that implementing the plans means actually doing some building. But before you can do any building, you've got to do the design. So this here we've got project preparation. So detailed design, writing specifications, bill of quantities, cost estimates, preparing the contract documents. That's part of it. But then who's going to do the work? Then you've got to go into the stage of procurement. You would decide what sort of contract you're going to have, what sort of people you want to have um, offering their services through tenders, evaluate the tenders, eventually award the contract, and then mobilize. Looks like we might actually be doing some digging here. About time too, I should say. But here we've got contract administration, even at this stage, site testing, supervision, then the actual works. Now this stage, I just want to say that we were doing a workshop like this once, and one of the people in the audience, one of the people who's actually on the machines, and he had a legitimate question to ask, said, what proportion of the budget of this local government is used up in all this hairy fairy stuff going around this, this cycle, compared to the amount of money that actually gets spent doing the work at the end, this works delivery stage? And I, we, we got an answer there, which is between 5 and 10 percent, and then I've asked other councils and road authorities this very same question, it is between 5 and 10 percent. And that's very encouraging because it says that if you, if you do your work, homework 5 to 10 percent and you do it really well, you can then spend the 95 percent of your money more effectively and more wisely. So it's really money well invested. So here we are now at the final stage here, works delivery, preparation and completion of works. This is the yellow stage, and we're, we're almost at the end. But just to, just to notice that you'll see here that I just added, uh, at the very end there, between works delivery and the defined network, we've got an extra red arrow. That is that we have now done the work, whether it's a new link or rebuilt road or maintained road, the road network is slightly different. So you need to go back and re-survey your road. Not everything, but the bits which have changed. We have the overall grouping here. We've got the current status, the future plans, and the works delivery. Um, or in plain English, know and understand your roads as they are now, plan an affordable future, and then make it real by doing the work. Excellent. So we've actually completed that work now and we've stepped through that cycle. So we've got another quick questions and these are very, very quick for us here. We're interested in about when your council is doing, who actually does your design work there? If you could quickly answer that, these are going to be even shorter. We're going to ask who does your design work, who does your new constructions and who does your maintenance? Okay, like Simon said, these need to be quick. So we're going to run through these fairly quickly. Um, for our first question here on design, we are looking at 50% um, of our audience are saying that it's done in-house. Excellent. Followed by another 38% that say external. So I'll just hide that and launch the next poll for us. And if everyone can once again get <coughs> their answers through as quickly as possible. New constructions. What do you do for your new constructions? So you've got your design work done, where do you go after that? We have same answer choices here, ladies and gentlemen, if everyone can get their responses through. And it's looking like our most popular answer choice here is the 65% uh, of people say external. So I'll pop that up on the screen for our audience to have a little look there. Uh, 65 say external, followed by 27% 20, uh, say in-house. And I'll hide that and launch our third poll once again, ladies and gentlemen, your um, responses here as quickly as possible would be much appreciated. And the question there is, who does your maintenance? The answer choices there are in-house external consultant, uh, oh, sorry, internal consultant, external or other. And I'll just leave that open for another moment there. So it's looking as though our most popular answer choice here, ladies and gentlemen, was in-house with 71% of voters saying in-house, followed by 18% uh, which go external. Excellent. So what are your thoughts on that, gentlemen? It's good. Well, 
I think it's uh, very interesting because um, 10 years ago there was a big trend and a political driver to stop doing work in-house and push it to the outside external people. And quite frankly, I'm quite pleased to see the work's being done more in-house again and maintaining all those skills within the host organization. I think there's nothing wrong with that at all. I think that's an important part uh, of your maintenance about when you go do that maintenance work, get those people to register what are the upcoming faults on your network and use those people to, to dual skill and figure out what's going on going to be next and that's a, a good help for managing road assets. Okay, now, now we're going to launch into the last stage of this whole webinar. We've got here the overall pavement cycle. You can see it there, but there's little difference here. We've now added this red heart in the middle here. This is our road database. The road database has very important functions. We store data, we process it, we report it, and we also use it for administering works. That database is linked in to all those processes. Now, though every time you do something, you take data information out from the database. For example, if you're doing a collection, data collection, you'll take information about the inventory out of the database, you'll do your data collection, and then you will put that data back into the database. So everything is recorded in the database. The database keeps track of what's going on. These reports don't have to be boring tables. They can be photographs, they can be graphs. And we're going to be giving a um, one of our, one of our um, webinars coming up in um, early September is all about this database, this asset register, and the reporting, reporting that you may need to do from that database. So there's a very, very important view to come to that. Now, I did say about looking at the future, and the future is blue, and I've made it blue again. So we now have uh, an additional tool, which is bolted onto the side of this, called our decision support tool, or you could some people call it an analysis engine. This is really good. It's for predicting the future. So it's good for horse racing, and as well as good for road management. And what we do here is we look at the data we've got, we estimate how things are going to be in the future before the future actually happens, and then we make decisions based on how we think things are going to turn out. What I'd like to emphasize here is that every decision that's made within that tool has to be based on information from the, from the, the database, but also all the answers are returned to that database, and you'll see the future performance. You'll see the future performance has been in blue within that database. An example has come up at the top there of, of a sort of prediction model you might have. Here we've got cracking going into the future, and we've got um, different cracking graphs up there, all dependent on climate. And one of the things we do is, is we also take account of climatic features in the modeling we have, and therefore we need to interrelate those. And we have here, a in the middle of September, on the 18th, we've got deterioration modeling and the levels of analysis, strategy, and program, and project. And uh, I'll be giving much more information in that area on that date. For some people who answered earlier in our polls that they were using uh, life cycle costing and you don't know what's going on in the magic black box uh, of that session, maybe that's something that you'll be able to understand once you've seen that session. Yep. Thank you. Okay, the next um, thing I'd like to talk about, which is all part of the real world application, is asset management and road safety. Now, road safety is a the key, the really is a key thing at the end of it, because that's what we want to achieve, a safe road. And we don't want to just wait for things to happen to go wrong and then go back and fix them. This day, this time, we want to be proactive. We want to predict the future. We want to estimate how things might be in the future, especially on the road safety angle, and therefore react, be proactive and fix problems before they turn into accidents. Up here, up here we have um, a interesting road. It's, uh, it's, it looks like a very nice road. It is. It's an avenue of honor leading into a provincial town. Each of those trees has got the name of a fallen serviceman attached to it. It is important. It's also extremely unsafe having those roads right so close to the, 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 um, the road. We cannot, we cannot do anything about it in terms of knocking those trees down. That is unacceptable. But there's just an example of the sort of problems we have where we have to balance his story and we have to balance Interesting uh, on this one here about the same asset management cycle applies to uh, road safety that it does about knowing what you have, so knowing that you have the risk of the, the trees on the road and then actually doing some planning about the standards. So the standards may be that we don't want to have trees or those kind of dangerous objects within a distance 
and then we actually design whether it be putting safety barriers along those or maybe reducing the speed in that, and that's the procuring and doing work. So the idea of risk, man risk management flows both through asset management and road safety. And we'll talk about that with uh, our expert, David McTinn, in uh, early October. Thank you very much. Another part of the applying things in the real way, and that is, what about trucks? Trucks are the, the lifeblood of our nation, so they, the truckies tell us, and they're probably sure I prefer to see railways myself, but anyway, um, even though I'm a road man. So modelling effects of heavy vehicles on roads, and then modelling effects of roads on heavy vehicles. I find that dichotomy very interesting, and both of them have to be looked at. We need to think about, are we going to ask the trucking industry to pay more for the use of the roads than the average taxpayer? Because they do damage the roads much more, having larger vehicles. We're going to think about how do we assess road links or special usage, whether it's um, milk truck or whether it's logging or mining industrial. And, and can we put larger trucks on our roads? Can we have these things called PBS vehicles, which are performance-based standards? Can we do that? We need to understand all these things. And to help us understand those things, we have a, um, a webinar coming up on September the 25th, Managing Increased Axle Limits on Your Network, where Nobert Michel, one of our experts in this area, is going to take us through that. I think it's an interesting part of science, the science about how can we actually do the understand how our logging trucks and our uh, probably short uses affect our roads. And we'll, we'll deal with that because I think uh, that science is there to be able to support um, you guys. Okay, now, we've hinted at this before, but I think it's um, a very key thing. Our network is a bit on the thin side simply because we don't have many taxpayers to pay for it, but that means that our network is vulnerable to the weather and vulnerable to climate. So we need to be able to understand how do we prepare for these events and what do we do once the event has passed. If you speak to people up in Queensland, you'll get some interesting stories. The first story is they, the simple one. You might say, well, look, once the cyclone's been through and the flood is, has flooded the road and they want to know when can they open the road again. Well, assuming the road has survived the flood, people are very eager to open the road, but you can open it too early. We can, we can show you how the road might still be extremely vulnerable, even though the, the free water is no longer on the surface, and you may need to delay the opening of the road, or else you'll build in extra damage to that road by loading it prematurely before it's ready. So that's the sort of thing. And we're going to do, uh, with the deterioration modeling and the levels of analysis, within that session we're going to talk about the effect of climate and how that can, must be taken into account of in our forward prediction modeling, our plans, and how we handle the future and maybe put money aside for, 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 for literally a rainy day. It's good. You can really start to, I hope you can see that you can really start to ask these questions, the what if questions, that what if I had more money, what if I had less money, or, or what if I had different climate conditions using those. I think, I think um, just on that issue, I think that's a, there's a very real example of that is that um, until a few years ago, Australia suffered from a 10 years of drought. And during that drought time, funny enough, it's very beneficial for the roads. The roads were doing fine. And little by little, the road budgets went down. And state road government, state road authorities, uh, or rather state governments, got used to paying less money for maintenance because the roads were doing rather well. But when the, when the normal weather came back and we returned to our normal weather cycles, the state road authorities, and I can think of Vic Roads and just about every other state road authority, were faced with having to maintain their network in normal seasonal wet conditions, but they were only having money which was being allocated during the time of drought, and they could not persuade the state government to up the road funds, and they still can't. But maybe if they do some more modelling and with our assistance and the assistance of other people, they can change that view. Um, now, just looking at the slide in front of you here, this is the final cycle. Now, you remember I showed it to you right at the beginning, and it looked a bit busy, but now I'd like to think that since you've been involved in building it up, you can own that diagram, and you can see actually it's not busy at all. It's just lots of simple concepts all bolted together to make a coherent whole. And I think that is the way to look at it. And when you can look at that and you can apply that to many things, not just roads, but just about any asset you've got. Thanks very much, John. I hope you've all uh, enjoyed getting, us, getting to the end of that cycle there. I hope it makes a lot more sense for you. So 
after this session we're nearly at the end. I'd like to encourage you, if you've seen on your screen, if you have any questions about the asset management cycle or some of the other sessions that are coming up, I would encourage you to enter your questions into the question box um, that on your webinar interface. And they come up for us here. We had a couple of questions. An earlier question we had was about um, the road safety and tying that together. And I'd like to thank uh, Aaron from Melbourne um, for that question. And if you have any other questions, please full be available. Mm -hmm. uh, another question here from Sean. Sean's asking about uh, whether the slides today will be available for download. Yes, Sean, great question. Uh, everyone who's participating today will receive a copy of the presentation material together with the recording of the webinar. Uh, so you can watch this again at your leisure or perhaps share it with uh, friends and colleagues that couldn't attend today and we welcome you to do that. In regards to the next question about the upcoming sessions, yes, all the sessions will follow the same format of being about 45 minutes plus about uh, 10 minutes of questions or further follow-ups for it. Um, but in saying that, um, it, it depends on the, uh, the I, I suppose, how inquisitive our audience is. If they have lots of questions and want to stay on for discussion, we have allowed up to 90 minutes per session, so we'll see how we go. I've got a technical question that's come across here, Ange. For John, what sort of percentage budget would an agency spend on asset management? Well, um, I did allude to this earlier, and I said between 5 and 10%. I think for local government it's probably around the 10% and for state road authorities it's more like the 5%. But uh, please can I implore um, all the managers in state road authorities, please don't add up the number of staff you've now got to fire because you're spending more than 5%. Um, I'm sure, don't forget that all the staff who are in asset management are making sure that you spend the 95% of the budget which ends up as hard things on the road properly. It's a very important job. That was a great question from Usman, so thank you for that. Uh, we are here for a few more moments, ladies and gentlemen, so don't be shy. Get your questions or comments through for us. Or if any pop to mind after the webinar has concluded, we'll pop up our contact details on the screen there for you and you can contact us at any time. Just the last question, I think, before we follow off the, the session. Um, it should be about, uh, can we talk more, are we going to talk about rural, rural or urban roads through the session? Um, I think given uh, Australia's got a mix of both of them, we will actually be presenting across both sections for it, and I think the appropriateness will come out in those future sessions about which ones we could uh, deal with. Thanks for your question, Agnes. That was a great one. Um, I think there's another fundamental question that's come through here, is what should be the expectation from the road network in a tight budget? Well, I'd like to answer that in the following way. If you had a good model, and what you would be able to do is if you could put your network into the model, you could put in your tight budget, you can push the button, and then demonstrate to the people who, who have the purse strings, who provide the money, that because you've got a tight budget, the future's looking a bit sorry for itself, and the road network is getting worse and worse and worse. And then maybe you'll, you'll persuade those people that there maybe your tight budget should not be such a tight budget and you'll be able to, to get a larger one. Yeah. Thanks very much. And uh, just some information about the next session that's coming up um, will be run by myself and Norbert Michel about collecting that data. And obviously questions such as John said about making decisions about our network need to be driven by which data we collect. So if we want to make those kind of decisions about how we make uh, our budget, we need to make sure that we're collecting good quality data to um, input into John's modelling or even just into your basic uh, current status report. So where are we up to? If that data going in isn't the correct correct level of, uh, correct quality of data, the answer is not going to be of any quality either. So we're going to go over what are some of those introductions and uh, and some of those introductions and some of those sessions, some of that information in the next session. If you haven't registered for if you haven't registered for any of that uh, information uh, for the next sessions, there's a, a link there on the page and you can follow that again. Um, else uh, obviously we've got to the questions, but if you would like to contact either John or myself in terms of specific questions about it or about the future sessions, um, please feel free to contact us and we'll be able to provide some further information.
And I think that's what's great about this upcoming series, Simon, is that it's not just what you're being presented on the day, but, but enrolling in that series also gives you access to our experts, our in-house experts here at ARB, um, through whom you can have ongoing discussions, uh, not just you know while the webinar series is uh, in session, but thereafter. So it's really giving you access to this um, well, quite frankly, this information that uh, possibly couldn't get anywhere else. So, so we thank you for joining us today. Simon and John's contact details are up there on your screen. And as I mentioned, we'll, we'll be sending this information out to you. So you don't have to worry about jotting that down. We thank you all for your time and attention uh, with our webinar today and hope that you can join us in future. And uh, have a great afternoon, everyone. See you again in the future. Yes, and thank you very much to Agnes, who's answered us three different questions. And the last one, she said um, she's looking forward to hearing from us again. So we're looking forward to you attending, Agnes. Yes. Okay.